So I just want to finish with a couple of uh, points, sort of ironic points about Brexit, as I see them anyway, and I've mentioned these in the book. Um, Brexit was all about taking back control. One of the ironies of Brexit was that it was never really anything to do with Europe. If it had been to do with being a member of the European Union, there would have been a proper debate about what it was like being in the European Union, but it wasn't. Brexit was about immigration, and Brexit was about the internal politics of the Conservative Party. That's essentially what Brexit was, why Brexit was called the way it was, when it was, and why the debates happened the way it did. Brexit gets real on New Year's Eve in just a couple of weeks. Uh, the UK leaves the European Union on December 31st this year. And here's another date. Uh, next year in 2021, Northern Ireland will mark its centenary, a big round number. But Brexit has jeopardized Northern Ireland's very existence. The Brexit process has complicated political relationships within Northern Ireland and helped destabilize the institutions set up in the wake of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. So always more than just a line on, on a map, the border has become really an existential marker of identity, as well as a reminder of the dark days of violent conflict in the past. Fergal Cochran argues that Brexit is actually the most significant ev event for Northern Ireland since the partition, and that Brexit is breaking peace in Northern Ireland. Friends, welcome to November's Chat and Chowder at World Boston with Breaking Peace, Brexit and Northern Ireland by Fergal Cochran. I'm Mary Eintema, the president of World Boston. I am pleased to introduce Fergal Cochran, our speaker. Uh, he was born and educated in Belfast and has been publishing and teaching on Northern Ireland and wider themes of violent political conflict and peace building for 30 years. He's the author of 10 books and numerous other publications, including articles in international peer review journals and chapters in edited book collections. His Northern Ireland, The Reluctant Peace, published by Yale University Press in 2013, was shortlisted for the Ewart Biggs Memorial Book Prize in 2015. And the second edition of that book, Northern Ireland, The Fragile Peace, will be published by Yale in 2021. Fergal was professor of international conflict analysis at the University of Kent and director of the Conflict Analysis Re Research Center, or CARC, uh, within the School of Politics and International Relations from 2012 to 2019. He's also held academic appointments at Lancaster University, Ulster University, and Queen's University Belfast. He's now a senior research fellow of CARC and professor emeritus at the University of Kent. And it's really late, late o'clock where he is, uh, past 10. So we're particularly pleased to have him with us tonight. Fergal, welcome to World Boston. Thanks very much, Mary. I'd just like to thank World Boston and uh, you know for for facilitating this, and uh, to yourself, Mary and Elise as well for all the work that's gone into it, um, and everybody who has uh, who's registered to to listen to this. So as Mary said, the title of the book is Breaking Peace. Um, Brexit in Northern Ireland and I just wanted to rather than give you a summary of the whole book which would exhaust me and you uh, watching I'm sure I'll just pick out some of the main themes from it um, talk a little bit about uh, I suppose the arguments uh, surrounding Brexit and why it's particularly important for the peace process in Northern Ireland and for the Good Friday Agreement slash Belfast Agreement of 1998, and also try and connect it in with the recent um, presidential election and president-elect Joe Biden's forthcoming administration. Um, and hopefully I can answer some questions around the edges of all of that as we go along. So um, the origins of the book were actually on the 23rd of June, 2016, that was the day of the referendum in the United Kingdom. Uh, the in-out referendum. So it was a very binary choice. Didn't really ask you for any complexity. Referendums are like that, you know? So it was, is it in or is it out? Are we to leave the European Union or are we to remain? And that was the very blunt um, uh, choice that people were faced with. And on the 23rd of June, I was actually running, or I was going over to Northern Ireland to run a workshop on devolved government 
because Northern Ireland was doing a very good job of breaking peace on its own without Brexit. Um, but when Brexit arrived, you know, it was a whole other um, set of problems. Um, and the picture that you can see on your screen there is of Storm and Parliament in Belfast opened in the 1930s. And this was the sort of the seat of government from 1921, or not 21, it wasn't created in 1921, but when it was opened, right up until 1972. And for a lot of people in Northern Ireland from the, the Catholic nationalist side, it was seen as a, um, a, a, a venue for their own subjugation and disenfranchisement because they lost every election that was held between 1921 and 1972. And for the unionist community, it was their seat of government. You know, it was the focus of attention and it was a majority rule of parliament. And the figure that you can see in the foreground there is Sir Edward Carson, a very well-known unionist leader uh, from the, the origins of the, the home rule movement. So uh, we went over on the 23rd of June after, the ref after, the, after we voted, we, went, we flew over to Belfast and we had this, we, we talked about our, 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 our program for the next day. And we were a bit worried about, we had a, we had a session on Brexit in the afternoon, but we thought it's probably going to be a remain outcome. So, you know, what's it going to be to talk about? It's going to be the status quo, you know, on you go. Uh, so um, we didn't have worried because the next morning at breakfast, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom had resigned. Uh, the UK had voted to leave the EU. And this is when, <clears throat> for me, sitting there in the workshop, I realized the, uh, what, what a meteor had just landed on us uh, because it hit Northern Ireland like a bolt from the blue. Everybody really expected Remain to win. And that was the same in Great Britain as well. So um, once it was a leave vote, it was a bit like a horror film when you see the camera director sort of suddenly, the camera suddenly pulls away, you know, and you sort of, the screechy music starts. It was a bit like that because all of a sudden, the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic became something else. It became the frontier of the European Union with the United Kingdom. So in other words, the, the, the Irish Republic wasn't just the Irish Republic anymore. It was a frontier to, of the EU to, or it would be, the frontier of the EU to a, a non-member state of the European Union. And of course, borders in, in Northern Ireland had been a, 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 a major uh, issue. Which side of the border do are you on? Which side of the border do you are you are you are you living on? So, okay. um, so that's uh, that was immediately recognised as a problem uh, with the people who were living in, in Northern Ireland. Um, and so, in some ways, Brexit actually happened in Northern Ireland on the twenty fourth of June. And there was a lot of the sort of discussions in Great Britain about when will Brexit happen. But for a lot of people living in Northern Ireland, it happened on the 24th of June 2016 because it immediately provided, it, it pushed identity politics back onto the front of the agenda. Uh, are you British or are you Irish? Are you in the EU or are you leaving it? These sorts of binary absolutes um, were once again back on the agenda. And the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process, it sort of muddied the waters. It allowed us to uh, agree to differ about where we're actually going and say, well, it's, it's the, the people of Northern Ireland can decide that in the future. The consent of the people of Northern Ireland can determine that down the line. Um, but the problem was that the ambiguities that surrounded the peace process uh, referendums are very bad at ambiguities and, and peace processes and diplomacy and negotiations all about ambiguities. If you try and get an absolute win, you're going to fail. And, and uh, peace agreements and negotiations are all about trying to massage that zero sum equation of your identity. You know, where is the sovereignty lying? Are you Irish? Are you British? And of course, the Good Friday Agreement allowed us to be both. It allowed us to be Irish and it allowed us to be British, and it allowed us to be Irish and British. And of course, the referendum sort of drove a wedge through that thing. So I think that this date, um, the Brexit date, the 23rd of June 2016, is up there as one of these iconic dates in the chronology of Northern Ireland. And I think it bookends partition very nicely. And we're having the centenary uh, next year. 
um, which is again become a, an issue. Some people want to celebrate 100 years of Northern Ireland. Some people don't want to celebrate that at all. So um, it's certainly up there with 1921 when Northern Ireland was created, 1972 when this majority rule parliament was, was suspended by London. Uh, 1998, when we established a power sharing uh, administration between nationalists and unionists. So that building that you can see on the slide there, there's now a power sharing uh, administration with both unionists and nationalists taking part in it. And then we've got 2016 and of course we've got 2021 next year. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the past because in Northern Ireland, as you probably know, if you know anything about Northern Ireland, the past and the present are intertwined indelibly uh, we can never quite get away from our history somebody once said that our, our history is always in front of us in northern ireland which is quite a good way of putting it you can never quite get away from it or at least diff people use using history for their own political ends so i grew up in belfast in the 1970s um and uh, you know th this is a place where territoriality and borders uh, were very um clear you know you didn't when you went into belfast city center you didn't just sort of drift in you had to go through a turnstile you had to be searched uh, your bag would be searched uh, there were uh, soldiers with weapons uh, there for security purposes asking you what your name was where you were going why you were going there now in the context of the sort of masking uh, covid debate in the united states where people are talking about their freedom you imagine sort of saying, well, you can't actually walk down that street. Tell me why you're going down that street. Never mind whether you've got a mask on or not. Or I won't let you down that street because I've decided that I don't want to let you go down there because you're a security risk. These sorts of issues were very visceral in the 1970s when I was growing up. But of course, these uh, um, wire meshes, searches, questions were there to try and uh, you know catch the people who were bombing the city and put a ring of steel around Belfast and so on but you didn't just drift along you knew very well where you were and you had to explain why you were there quite frequently and you felt you were lucky to actually get down the street and there wouldn't be a, a bomb explosion or, or a bomb um, scare going off and of course the border was part of that whole infrastructure and this was the 1970s this is just outside Newry on the just outside the border between Neary and Dundalk and you can see there from the image that you didn't cross the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland accidentally or quickly or without some sense of of tense uh, you know uh, angst um, it was you know you had to wait to do it you had to answer questions about why you were crossing the border you may have to get out of your car open the, the trunk of your car show a soldier what was inside the car you know, it was a whole big palaver about getting from one part of the island of Ireland to the other part. And yes, of course, that had costs and that had um, inconveniences, but it also had a sort of existential factor as well, which is that it created a chill between the north and the south. Now, when I was growing up, you quite often didn't see a, a car from the south in the north. Uh, it was quite rare to see it. So... Um, uh, you know, there was almost like an uh, invisible apartheid created by the uh, the border being there. Um, now that was the that was the sort of previous situation, and the peace process and the the Good Friday Agreement helped mitigate this, helped us make the border invisible. And I spoke to a journalist when I was writing the, the reluctant peace book that Mary referred to, and I said, "What's the best thing about the peace process? You know, is it the north south bodies?" Is it the power sharing executive? And uh, this journalist said, it's the motorway between Dublin and Belfast, because that's the reality. That's what allows you to live in one state and work in another state. You, know, you can live in Dublin, work in Belfast or vice versa. And it took all the heat out of it. You didn't have to get out of your car. You didn't even know where the border was. And so it was that organic growth really uh, allowed, to, allowed people to, to uh, connect, reconnect together again. So that was the before, and this is the after. Now, this is a, I took this photograph myself. This is separate, this is the border now. And uh, this is two little towns. One is a town called Belcou in County Fermanagh. And the other side of the road is in the Irish Republic. And it's a town called Black Lion in County Cavan. 
and the border is in the river underneath that bridge. And I thought it was interesting that, you know, I didn't know where the border was. You can't really see it physically at all. And the only way I was able to work it out was my sat nav knew in the car where the border was more than I knew, just being in the physical space. And you can see there on the, I sort of took a picture of it because I thought it was quite ironic that the sat nav knew where the Irish border was and I'd been born and reared there and didn't know where it was. Um, now the worry of course is that with Brexit, the border is gonna be back and it's gonna be physical. This, this, this was the worry for several years during the Brexit negotiations, that the border would come back, you would see it, um, it would be sort of uh, a hard border back in Ireland with all the, the security issues that that would, um, that would raise again. And so a lot of the, a lot of the worry was that there's gonna be a hard border in Ireland, that's gonna confront us with being on the wrong side of the border, one way or the other. I'm either on the British side or on the Irish side, and I know which side's which. But of course the peace process allowed us to muddy that water and not really know in the here and now at the precise point of where the border was uh, at any given time. So just to say a couple of things about the title, um, a bit of a provocative title, I suppose. Initially I had a question mark at the end of it and I just gave up on that uh, during the writing process. Uh, and I wanna give you a couple of reasons why. Uh, one is because the cement and the peace process was a relationship between Britain and Ireland. Uh, it's not a very sexy thing, probably, you know, to talk about intergovernmental relationships. Um, it doesn't really make a lot of headlines, but uh, the relationship between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, uh, they really jointly managed the peace process during the 1990s. They're co-signatories of the Good Friday Agreement and supposedly joint guarantors of it as an international treaty. So the Good Friday Agreement is an international treaty uh, and the two sovereign governments are signatories to it. Um, and very much spoke uh, as one uh, publicly. Lots of joint communiques been given during the peace process and certainly 1990 and onwards. There's been very, very few joint communiques since 2016. Uh, very much being now uh, on opposite sides of the negotiating table over Brexit. And Northern Ireland has sort of fallen in between the two. So Anglo-Irish relations have dipped quite substantially since 2016. And Northern Ireland can only suffer as a result of that in the longer term. Um, uh, it was not helped by the fact that in 2017, the British government lost its majority in Parliament was trying to negotiate Brexit when it was very weak internally. And it relied on the Democratic Unionist Party, Ian Paisley's former party, uh, to keep itself in government. And so it raised lots of serious questions about how the British government could be a co-guarantor of a power sharing system when it was in fact beholden to the DUP, who was one of the, um, one of the parties in that system. So there was a, Accusations of bad faith over that. Um, the other issue, I think, was that the whole peace process was based on the consent of the people who lived there. Uh, that it was up to the people of Northern Ireland to decide on their future. Now, the people of Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU. They didn't vote to leave. And so what Brexit did was it really shrink-wrapped a sense of Britishness into more of an Englishness and more of a, a right-wing uh, English project. And the Scottish uh, suffered the same as the Irish to this extent, in that Scotland also, as you probably know, Scotland voted to remain in the EU as well. Northern Ireland voted to remain quite significantly by 56, 42, or 44. So quite, but quite a significant margin. Uh, so two of the uh, you know, constituent parts of the United Kingdom voted to remain. But a day after, or certainly when Theresa May became British Prime Minister, she said Britain has spoken, the people of Britain have spoken, the people of Britain have decided to leave the EU. But of course, that was a misnomer. 17 million people voted to leave the EU, but 16 million voted to remain in the EU. And two of the constituent countries or regimes in the United Kingdom voted to remain in the European Union. So, um, uh, this immediately then raised the issue of what country do you live in? So um, 
once you say, well, our country has decided to leave, our sovereign country has decided to leave, it, it, the DUP were quite keen on that idea because uh, they wanted to leave the EU on the same terms as the rest of their country. But of course, for Irish nationalists, uh, they had another country, which was Ireland. And uh, they may or may not have adhered to, uh, you know, to, a, to a, a connection with the United Kingdom. But it, to some degree, it pushed nationalists further towards the Irish Republic. It, sque it, it forced them to choose between an Irishness and a Britishness when the whole Good Friday Agreement was not choosing, not having to choose. Um, so that's why it, it really increased tensions. Other thing I wanted to say was that, yes, 56% of Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU, but that hides a big difference between the nationalist Catholic population and the Protestant Unionist population. So between 88 and 90% of Catholic nationalists voted to remain in the EU. And only about 35 to 38 percent of Protestant Unionists voted to remain in the EU. So, in other words, Brexit did not complicate the ethno-national problem. It, re it it reinforced it, um, and that was that also, you know, was a major was a major issue in terms of the political dynamics that were were existing there. And it was very difficult for Sinn Féin and the DUP to reach any working relationship. Um, because of the Brexit uh, situation. Um, and so really Brexit has stress tested the agreement. Um, since 1998, this has been the sort of the document that, that we've all been focused on and several iterations of it since. Uh, but it's based on the notion of consent that is up to the people of Northern Ireland uh, to decide on their futures. Um, and of course, what it really did was it pulled the rug from under these devolved institutions, not just in Belfast, but in, in Scotland as well, because essentially Britain, London was saying it's, it's the United Kingdom that's sovereign, really. It's not the devolved administrations. And we will be leaving the European Union as one unit. And so it, it really stress tested, uh, stress tested them. So I just wanted to get on to the uh, president-elect Biden. Uh, and the Biden-Harris administration, because I think this is really fascinating in terms of the impact that it's going to have on the United Kingdom and on uh, uh, Brexit itself. Um, uh, uh, as you probably know, uh, Joe Biden has got uh, strong connections with Ireland um, uh, and he's very aware of them and has visited Ireland several times. Um, it was skeptical at best about the whole Brexit project, was had a front row seat during eight years of the Obama administration. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, certainly um, I'm sure the relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom is going to be perfectly cordial. Uh, but, but Biden has already come out and said that if there's any damage to the Good Friday Agreement, or any damage to the peace process, then his administration would not look kindly on that. Um, and uh, his priorities are not going to be a trade deal with, with the United Kingdom. They're going to be looking to the United Kingdom as an ally over uh, America's role in NATO and the whole role of NATO generally. He is a sort of multilateralist. He is going to want to establish international partnerships. And I'm sure the United Kingdom is going to be a very important player in that. Um, but the problem for Boris Johnson, the prime minister, is that when Donald Trump was president, a free, a free trade deal with America seemed to be, in, a, in the context of no deal with the EU, looked, looked like it was a feasible option. But a, a, a deal with the, the Biden presidency with a no deal Brexit looks like an impossibility. And so uh, that will not be lost on Boris Johnson, I'm sure. Um, and we'll have to see how that plays out over the next couple of weeks. But we're now really up against it in terms of a deal. Uh, you know, there are days, uh, there's a ticking clock, as Mary said, going to the end of December. And on the 1st of January, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland is going to be the, the, the hot seat of the economic fallout of Brexit. Just to give you a little, little example, a practical example of that. Um, I don't know if any of you like cottage pie. Uh, as, a, as a as a thing to eat, but apparently cottage pie. I don't know who who actually did who worked this out, but cottage pie goes through nine 
border um, uh, changes before it actually gets from production to consumption. Uh, and that, so in other words, products go backwards and forwards. They're going to be needing export licenses. Uh, costs and delays are going to go up significantly if there's a no deal Brexit. Uh, supermarkets have already talked about contingency planning, uh, product reduction. Uh, there are worries of food shortages in Northern Ireland uh, because of um, the fact that, that delays over just-in-time deliveries are going to be uh, are going to be accentuated in the context of a No Deal outcome. So this has got this is getting very real very quickly uh, for people in Northern Ireland, and it really those issues are not making the, the media headlines of Great Britain at all, hardly at all. And this is one of the interesting sort of ironies of Brexit. Um, Northern Ireland didn't figure. The biggest problem for the United Kingdom has been Northern Ireland in its prosecution of Brexit, getting Brexit done. But Northern Ireland was not an issue in the referendum at all. It was only really afterwards. It was, a, it was an afterthought. And similarly now, um, the practical implications of a, of a no-deal Brexit um, are uh, pretty much an afterthought in terms of, uh, in terms of the Great Britain agenda. And this has been one of its problems. It's never really seen Brexit through an Irish lens. Um, maybe it was never capable of doing that. So Biden, the Biden-Harris administration, I think, will be has got a soft power leverage over the British government over how Brexit evolves from here. Um, it's interesting that Boris Johnson is making a lot of noise about uh, climate change recently. Uh, he hadn't really been saying an awful lot about that, in my, to my knowledge, uh, up until Joe Biden won the election. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that factors into the final days of the negotiations. But I would be prepared to put, you know, a good, if I were you, you know, a couple of dollars on the fact that if there is a no deal Brexit, that there will not be a free trade deal with America. And that that Dublin, if, if Dublin makes um, representations to the Biden presidency over the damage to the Good Friday Agreement that they'll be listened to, and that um, that behind, certainly behind the scenes that there'll be there are communications going from Washington to London, London about that. Um, even if it isn't, you know, in the greater scheme of things, uh, publicly stated. So I just wanted to finish with a couple of. Uh, points, sort of ironic points about Brexit, as I see them anyway, and I've mentioned these in the book. Um, Brexit was all about taking back control. One of the ironies of Brexit was that it was never really anything to do with Europe. If it had been to do with being a member of the European Union, there would have been a proper debate about what it was like being in the European Union, but it wasn't. Brexit was about immigration, and Brexit was about the internal politics of the Conservative Party. That's essentially what Brexit was, why Brexit was called the way it was, when it was, and why the debates happened the way it did. Another irony is that Sinn Féin, who for a century, pretty much, have denied the um, legitimacy of Northern Ireland as a legitimate entity, uh, as far as they're concerned, it's a partitioned state uh, from uh, the rest of Ireland. And for many generations, they had uh, not sat in uh, in legislative um, parliaments in Northern Ireland because they and they didn't sit in Stormont, they wouldn't sit in local councils and so on. Um, and they changed that in the 1980s and through the 90s. And now there are no better defenders of the self-determination of Northern Ireland than Sinn Féin, who were, of course, originally very Eurosceptic, seeing it as sort of rich person's club. And now they are, you know, tub thumpers for the European Union and for the self-determination of Northern Ireland, which is quite an ironic turnaround in some ways. Uh, equally ironic, if not more ironic, and probably the biggest headline of all, is that Irish unity has probably never been as close as it is now. And the reason for that is because of the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, who were pro-Brexit, who, who had major influence with Theresa May's government, uh, after the 2017 general election, um, and who with and who with who who prevented Theresa May from getting her Brexit legislation through the House of Commons, because they had the votes to stop it, and what they've delivered is a border in the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and the Great Britain, and they're now having to be their own jailers, setting up customs posts in Belfast and Larne, 
with Great Britain when they were the party who said we must leave as one country with the rest of the United Kingdom. And what they've ended up with is Boris Johnson um, cutting them loose when he had to last year, uh, making a, uh, making a, signing the, the withdrawal agreement, the Northern Ireland Protocol that effectively is going to put a border, not have a border on the island of Ireland, but put the border in the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, which then raises questions about, uh, I suppose, um, whether Northern Ireland is now in a different status with within the United Kingdom. We're, what we're effectively going to see is a border within the United Kingdom, de facto. It's not going to be called that. That's what it's going to be. Um, one last point maybe to mention is that, uh, as Mary said there, uh, I've got a, a, a revised version of my Yale University Press book coming out next year to mark the centenary of Northern Ireland. And one of the questions I ask in that book is, how far into its next century is Northern Ireland going to actually get? Uh, and I think it really depends on how hard Brexit lands on Northern Ireland. Um, if, because, because, of course, Northern Ireland was based on the Union being economically strong. And if we're faced with a you know, United Kingdom outside the EU, a United Kingdom smaller internationally, as far as countries like the United States are concerned, uh, where they're more concerned with the EU than they are with the UK, um, where Dublin and the Irish Republic is a secular, modern, uh, uh, industrialised country, then the equation over uh, whether you would vote for reunification changes. And the idea of a border poll was pretty much a thought experiment for academics up until Brexit. And it's now on the front burner of political debate, both in the North and the South. I'm not sure if we call it the front burner of political debate, but certainly there. Um, and it won't be the DUP and it won't be Sinn Féin who decide on that. It will be the sort of middle 20, 15 to 20% of the population of Northern Ireland, the undecided voters, the swing states in American, you know, the Pennsylvanias and the, and the Michigans and so on. It'll be, it'll be those those groups and they're there to be they're there to be convinced and um it really all depends on how brexit lands on us from january onwards if it's a soft brexit if there's a deal between britain and the eu um and if anglo Irish relations improve then you know the status quo is going to be much more tenable if it's a no deal brexit a crash landing uh, economic difficulties then the arguments for um, uh, coming back into the EU through a, a, a reunified Ireland uh, becomes much more viable. And uh, I can see that uh, being on, discussed over the next decade or so. But anyway, that, book, that book's going to be out uh, next March with Yale. And um, uh, just finally, because my time's up, thank you very much for listening. We have and, just and a minute and, left. And uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll wind up there. I've got a, a website on the slide there. If you want to read any more, you can read it there. So thanks very much. Oh, fantastic. Okay, and um, we can probably put that website into chat as well so that people can pick that up. Thank you so much, Virgil. I'm sure that we have some questions. Um, yes, we do. Uh, okay, and um, I actually, well, no, I'll save my question. I'll let our uh, distinguished members uh, go first. Um, yeah, actually, let's uh, let's go to Ursula, um, our wonderful colleague from the British American uh, Business Council of New England, great rural Boston friend. Ursula, what's uh, what's your question? We'll pull you in. Okay, my question is: since the Brexit vote was so close. Why didn't David Cameron just declare the results to be interesting information? <laughs> yes. Um, well, that's a very, uh, 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 very good question. Um, I think the reason he did that was probably because he was too weak then to say that. Now, oh. um, I think Cameron was probably pushed into the referendum uh, by UKIP. And if he had then denied the majority vote, which he could have done constitutionally, of course. Yeah. Then he would have been he would have been he, he would have been attacked by UKIP and probably his own party as well. And and of course the Conservative Party has been torn apart by Europe 
for a generation, if not more. So, yeah, there, he could have said this is a, an advisory, but after the referendum, you know, it, I, I'm not sure what your view of that, Ursula, would be, but my view is probably because he was too weak to do anything else by that point. And I, I think what he should have done was say, because he nearly, of course, lost the Scottish referendum a couple of years previously, and uh, in 2014. And of course, when the opinion polls turned against, he also rushed back up to Scotland and said how much they loved the Scottish. Uh, and what he should have said, I think, about Brexit would have been to preserve the union, we'll have to have a majority in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England to have Brexit. And he, if, if he'd been strong enough to do that, which he wasn't, then the result would have been a foregone conclusion. And he could have had his referendum, said he'd given his referendum and not had to deliver it. Let's see. I'm not sure if my colleague has uh, got people ready to go here. Ruel, are you with us? Um, I, my question has to do with uh, what happens if, in fact, Scotland does have another referendum and decide to secede? Well, now you'll have a UK that's breaking apart. Will that affect uh, Northern Ireland, perhaps even renew ideas about joining with Ireland again? Or, yeah, well, I mean, or will it result in violence again? Yeah, I mean, well, the, uh, there's two questions in there, I think. So, so um, it's a really great question. Uh, um, I'd, I'd, I'd say that uh, the odds of another Scottish referendum are very high over the next five years, uh, certainly, particularly once Brexit happens. And, you know, it happens in Scotland, it happens for Scotland. Um, the opinion polls in Scotland are, are pretty much uh showing an acceleration of of a desire for independence and i think covid is also part of this because the experience of the scottish has been you know nicola sturgeon the first minister of scotland has been seen to have done a pretty good job over covid in a way that maybe the scottish view of boris johnson hasn't been quite so uh quite so positive so i think that raises Interesting questions for unionists. What do you do when the union disappears behind your back? You know, how do you then have a, who is your union with? And it, it doesn't technically damage Northern Ireland's position within uh, what the United Kingdom or the disunited Kingdom. Uh, it doesn't technically change that. But it would certainly uh, take one of the pillars away, I think, of the equation, you know, which was a lot of the unionists view is a connection with Scotland and they see their unionism as similar to the Scottish unionism within the United Kingdom. So if Scotland go independent, um, I think unionists, one of the one of the major sort of pillars of their political allegiance will be certainly dented. Uh, and I also think that on the other side of it, it gives a stronger uh, push from the Irish nationalist side to say that, you know, you're you're putting your your money on a on a on a on a on a on a slow horse here, you know. Why not rejoin the European Union um, with the with and and uh, you know to sell the idea of Irish reunification? If if they're sensible, they'll they'll it'll all be about being in the European Union as much as it will be about being in, in some sort of Irish entity, whatever that might end up as. Uh, on the point about violence, um, I. I certainly think there will be smuggling uh, post Brexit. And uh, once you once you've got a border with different tariffs, you're going to have smuggling. Uh, you're going to have criminality. Um, you may well have, depending on the type of border, you may well have uh, politically motivated criminality, which is where it gets slightly more interesting. Um, I don't think you're going to get large scale violence the way we had it in the 1960s and 70s, though. I think that the underlying drivers for that. Uh, aren't there anymore, but the organizations are still there and um, uh, their economic drivers for that paramilitary uh, activism uh, is still there and the people are still there. So uh, yeah, I think, I think, um, I, I, I think the, the potential for violence is still there, but I don't see it getting to the levels that it was in the 70s and 80s. Actually, Fergal, can I can I ask you to round that out? Because um, I think many of us um, think of um, those days of violence, as as you mentioned. Why are those drivers not present now? What were they? 
Um, okay, so really what you had in the 60s, well, look, this brings us back to the United States, of course, because um, uh, what you had in the 1960s was the emergence of a civil rights movement, particularly amongst the, the Catholic national side of the population who, who lost all these elections. They eventually got fed up with it and thought, well, there's no point in the formal political system isn't delivering. Uh, so we'll have to take uh, civil disobedience measures. Uh, we'll have to take to the streets. And they, they were inspired by the American civil rights movement and by the arrival of television as well and by the French riots in the 60s and so on. So, and by an educated middle class who had come through the university system uh, and free education uh, from the post-war, ironically, from the post-war British sort of 1940 Butler Education Act. So they'd come through, they'd sort of say, well, this is clearly unfair. And they'd started um, protesting peacefully. But as these protests got more violent uh, with stone throwing, and of course, once you ban a per once you ban a march, once you say your march is illegal and the police will remove you, then you can guarantee that more people will come the next week. <laughs> uh, and then it gets political. And then once the stone throwing starts, the political analysis disappears and it becomes much more of a sectarian uh, battle. Um, and so it evolved from a civil rights agitation over uh, electoral gerrymandering, uh, over the allocation, it was all very, you know, all politics is local. So it was all about the allocation of public housing, about un unemployment levels amongst the Catholic population. There was no, I mean, in, back in those days, relig your religious, your religious uh, affiliation could be used as a reason not to employ you. Uh, and in fact, again, it was America that played a big role in fair employment legislation in Northern Ireland um, uh, back, in the, back in the early 90s with the Clinton administration. So uh, the drivers were discrimination, uh, security, uh, you know, the police were pretty much made up of 90% of one side of the population, which was the Protestant Unionist population. Uh, so it was a, a, a non-transparent, armed police force policing a recalcitrant uh, uh, disenfranchised minority um, who felt that the political system could not deliver for them but also you had a lot of discrimination a lot of poverty amongst the unionist population as well and they couldn't understand why the catholics were saying that they were second class citizens well, a lot of working class protestants felt that they were second class citizens so but nonetheless an attempt to reform uh, went too slowly misdiagnosed the problem um, rioting, pogroms, people getting burnt out of their houses, uh, rampant sectarianism. British army arrived as supposedly peacekeepers, but were controlled by this unionist government. Uh, and of course, then became peace enforcers very quickly. And um, then you had uh, 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 the old IRA rearming itself and then taking on an undeclared war with the British state. Uh, and of course, that escalated and that became internationalized through things like Bloody Sunday uh, in 1972. Um, and and, they, and uh, America uh, gave a lot of uh, dollars for the armed struggle uh, or terrorism, as Margaret Thatcher would, uh, would define it or would have defined or did define it. Uh, but also the internationalization brought sucked in people like Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, who provided Semtex and you know, sophisticated weaponry and so on. And so the whole thing became a sort of escalating arms race between a guerrilla movement and the British state and ended up in a, in a stalemate. And so the drivers were uh, economic, they were security, um, legal uh, arguments about the administration of justice, the lack of justice. Um, those, those issues are not there now. There is firm employment legislation. Uh, the, the Catholic population does not feel that it is second class in the way that it did in the 1960s. That's probably, a, I'll probably give you a long lecture on the civil rights movement, probably shouldn't have done. But, you know, today, yes, there are grievances over identity politics, but the underlying disparity, and even the numbers are different. So back in the 60s, you know, you had a dominant unionist community, but it's very 50-50 now in terms of the population split. So even if you were to see it as sort of Catholics on one side, Protestants on the other, and it's much more complicated than that, but let's even take that. You're not looking at a 60-40 permanent majority, permanent minority problem. It's much more even Stephen. 
Uh, and again, that I think helps the whole power sharing type model. And uh, yep. you know, Good. so I think I, th I think the reasons for the emergence of violence are not, are not there at the moment. That's that's really helpful for uh, outsiders. Um, I wanted to go back to um, actually something that you said um, when we were um, in the virtual green room, Fergal, you mentioned this, but I just think it was so compelling. If you could um, round this out a little bit, you, you, you mentioned that the, 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 we're talking obviously about the virus, that's what everyone does these days. Um, and you said that from, you know, your perspective across the pond, our um, conflicts and, and tension around masking um, and all the emotion that, that comes with that reminded you very much of uh, growing up in the 70s in Northern Ireland and, and kind of that tension. Um, and you said a fascinating thing that it's, it's not about science anymore, it's, it's about identity. So help us understand how those things are, are similar to you. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, a classic conflict uh, mentality really, which is that you don't need to listen to what somebody says to you because you already know what they think. Right. So the mask and non-mask debate, to me, watching it, it seems to be it's not really about the mask. It's about what the mask represents. Uh, it's a more existential issue. I mean, it is about the mask. It's about public health. But but from the people who, who are reluctant to wear masks, they feel that, you know, the mask is the thin end of the wedge to their other rights-based constitutional Thing. I mean, a gun control could be another dimension of it. I, I, I don't know whether there's a correlation between mask wearing, non-mask wearing, and 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 uh, gun gun control, and you know, wanting wanting sort of M60 machine guns. But um, I think that it's so. And for a lot of people in conflicts, um, this sort of it's the symbolism of the thing, and it's the the fact that uh, there's a sectarianized a sectarianization, if you like, of relatively mundane things, um, because it because the mask is an emblem of other things, and so if you see somebody talking about wearing a mask, you, your mentality jumps to extrapolate that across a whole range of different di dimensions. It could be Democrat versus Republican. I mean, I may be speaking out of turn here in terms of American politics, but uh, it could be rural versus urban. It could be an age an age demographic going on there as well um but you know but the emblem the symbol um in the, in the case of northern ireland it could be for instance uh the, the sports that you play you know it, it doesn't really matter if you say you're a catholic or a protestant if you it, it's about whether you're it, that's just a badge of ethnicity and that's a badge of whether you are one of us or one of the other or whether you believe in the whole sort of iconography of, 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 of that I believe in or whether you are on the other side of that fence and to me um, with the with the Trump presidency uh, I can see a very sort of sectarian and you can see it with the vote you know nearly 80 million people voting for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and 70 odd million voting for Donald Trump and the votes come out on both sides uh, it's a very divided country clearly and there is very little middle way you know, and I think that the mask versus non-mask debate is is sort of almost emblematic of that sectarianized situation. And in Northern Ireland, you know, if you play one sport like Gaelic football or hurling, you would be perceived as a Catholic, and a whole extrapolation of your political viewpoints would follow. And this is certainly when I was growing up. I mean, it would be enough to get you beaten up at a bus stop to sure. carry a hurling stick, or to carry a rugby ball on the other side, because edu because our education systems are very divided. And so Catholics go to Catholic schools, learn Catholic sports. Protestants go to state schools, learn other sports. So you carry a cricket bat, it's emblematic of the fact that you're British. You carry a hurling stick, it's emblematic of the fact that you're Irish. And so those very objects become sectarianized. And, and, and it doesn't really matter if you think, well, I'm carrying a hurling stick, but you know, I've got a very cosmopolitan outlook on, the, on events. It doesn't really matter. Everything is sort of, there's a reductionism that happens in conflicts. And to me, in the States, from the outside, I think the mask debate is sort of emblematic of that sectarian scenario, you know, and um, we'll have to see where that goes, I'm sure. Fascinating. But, 
All right, so uh, Ed, are you okay? Can you uh, come on? Is your mic working? If not, we'll go over to Brian. Okay, looks like uh, we can't get Ed. Maybe he'll join us in the post chat chat. Brian, what's your question? Go right ahead. What about Johnson's internal market bill? What's the impact and will um, the EU ratify the any agreement if he keeps pushing that bill through? Good question. Um, on the second part of that, no. Uh, EU will not ratify any deal with the internal market bill there. And the reason for that is because it gives, just for people who are not au fait with the internal market bill, effectively what this does is it supersedes an international treaty that the United Kingdom has signed. And so it, it gives uh, the United Kingdom, it almost allows it to supersede its international obligations and its, and its agreements with the European Union. So you would never... I mean, um, I hope you know nobody has to go through a divorce or has ever done, but if you had a divorce lawyer and the two divorce lawyers were having a chat and one divorce lawyer said to the other divorce lawyer, just leave it with me and sure, I'll decide. No divorce lawyer in their right mind would say, mm -hmm. okay, I'll give you unilateral choice over working this thing out and you can decide it. That's not the way it works. So the internal market bill um, allows the United Kingdom to unilaterally dispense with aspects of the withdrawal agreement that it's made with the EU. So there's no way the EU is going to let that happen. Um, there's also no way that the uh, American government, the incoming American government's going to, I mean, if I've read, Joe Biden's already come out and against the internal market bill for that very reason, because how can you, and uh, members of the Conservative Party, including Theresa May, as you probably know, Brian, have also come out and said that, you know, we would be an international laughingstock uh, the next time we sign an international treaty with anybody, when we've said in Parliament, and I don't know if this has ever happened before, but a, a serving minister has said, we will break the law in certain uh, unspecified and limited ways when it suits us to do so. So would you ever sign a, a deal with somebody who said that? Probably not. So uh, it will be interesting to see how the internal market bill gets adjusted, if it does get adjusted, but I think it probably will need to be, even though Johnson said he, he's not going to. I can't see a deal with the EU unless that is significantly revised. Okay, thank you very much. I really fear that um, our time is winding down. Um, yeah, I'm afraid we're gonna have to wind this up. I'm, I am sorry that we did not get to all the questions, but boy, Fergal, you have, uh, raised many questions in our mind and also answered a bunch of uh, very fascinating topic that um, I think nobody nobody could have imagined a few years ago that we would, we would be talking about Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland in this way. Uh, Fergal, thanks for joining us um, uh, from uh, all the way over there late at night. Uh, I hope many of you will join us um, and in our informal post chat chat um, and uh, Fergal, once again, thank, thank you and good night, everybody. Hope to see you again soon. It's a pleasure. <laughs>